Okay, I think, so I think we might, might get started. Uh, so for those of you who weren't here yesterday, my name's Professor Julian Savalescu. I'm the Hero Chair in Practical Ethics. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the second Low Bell Lecture uh, to be given by Professor Kenneth Kendler, Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry for, from Virginia Commonwealth University. I won't repeat uh, all of Professor Kendler's bio, but just a couple of lines for those of you who weren't here yesterday. Professor Kendler trained in medicine psychiatry at Stanford and Yale, and since 1983 has been a world leader in studies of the genetics of psychiatric and substance use disorders, including uh, schizophrenia, major depression, alcoholism, personality disorders, drug abuse, and dependence. Uh, he has chaired the scientific review committee uh, of DSM-5 and has served as director of the Virginia Institute of Psychiatric and Behavioral Genetics. Uh, this is the second of and final of the Lobel lectures. Uh, it's been recorded and the questions will be recorded, so bear that in mind. Come on, Phil, can we sit down? Uh, and uh, if you don't want your question recorded, perhaps uh, change it. S somebody uh, left a memory stick here last night, so if, if you've lost a memory stick that's got integral AES uh, on it, uh, please come up to me. So I'd like to welcome Professor Kendler to give the second lecture, which you can see is the DAPL Causal World of Psychiatric Disorders. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see familiar faces in the audience. So I haven't done a two-part lecture series before, so this is interesting. Uh, in my family, we call this a twofer, sort of two for the price of one. Um, but I hope that I can, by the end of this, show you how the relatively extensive empirical work that I described yesterday really fits in to the broader problem I'm trying to address here. So I'm going to try to tackle what I think are two interrelated questions, each of which are huge. And of course, the, the hubris involved in trying to treat these in such a brief period of time, but you'll have to forgive me for that. So the first is the problems and new approaches towards the issues of psychiatric nosology. I have been, as we say in the United States, a DSM warrior. That means that I have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours on phone calls and in conferences now spanning my first meeting with Bob Spitzer in about 1984, involvement in DSM-3, R, DSM-4, and being in the eye of the storm of DSM-5. And I'm gonna talk about an area that, that I, at least for me, is applied philosophy of science trying to give some conceptual structure to what we are about in this every 10 to 15 year self-flogging exercise that knows that at least in the, on, on my side of the Atlantic, we go through and we revise DSM. Uh, in uh, Switzerland, you folks do something similar in the World Health Organization. And, and how do we even begin to structure what we might be doing? And that's the concept of epistemic iteration. And then, as if that's not a small enough topic to look at, I'm going to do, and, and here the title is really quite grandiose, and I apologize for that, is really what is the structure of psychiatric science and I have really two underlying purposes here as well. I'm gonna to try to be descriptive because I'm gonna actually show a little empirical study of trying to get a sense if you go through reading psychiatric and psychology journals, what's the nature of the pattern and distribution of the, of the studies that we find? What do they treat? How often are they within versus cross levels? And then I will switch to, again, an unapologetically proscriptive stru uh, structure about the way of my vision of what will be necessary to move this kind of giant corpus of, of psychiatric and psychological work forward in time. So it's a pretty broad agenda. Before we do that, I wanna take some time to try to historically contextualize. And if there's anything that I've been reading in more actively over the last three or four months, rather than philosophy of science, which I, as my wife will tell you, am addicted to, and Amazon is terribly seductive. It's so bloody easy to order books if I can only read them as fast as I can order them, but I have a whole pile. Um, is to actually talk more about the historical contextualization of where we are within the history of what, of how we have thought about diagnoses in medicine in general. I have found this to be very useful in sort of conceptualizing. And I will give you only the, the quickest of sketches, but I wanted to start with, with, with something that I thought was particularly appropriate, and that's this book. This happens to be my copy. 
uh, the anatomy of melancholy. I hope it comes through reasonably clearly here. You can tell that the publication date is 1624. The anatomy of melancholy, what is it with all the kinds, causes, symptoms, prognostic, and several cures of it in three main partitions? And I want to use this as an example of how did Burton think about in this particular institution, the causes of this major syndrome that I have been preoccupied with through my professional life, and I showed you all these fancy, lovely color diagrams just uh, yesterday about this. How would uh, Burton have done this? So uh, you begin, this is, he, he gives an outline in graphical form um, of the uh, causes, and I will show you this part right here. So there are two main divisions, and again, I have to step up here so I can read it myself. This is the causes, and it begins with impulses, sins, concupiscence, a lovely word that rolls off the tongue. And then this is instrumental, which includes intemperance and all second causes. So I'm going to really go through quickly the set of causes that Burton postulated for major depression. So let's go to this next page, and we can see that there are supernatural causes. So this is God and the evil, and then this is the devil, um, and then this is magicians, witches, and others. This is primarily the stars, as in aphorisms, signs, uh, metroscopy, chiromancy. Okay? Then we have congenital, which includes old age, okay? and <laughs> temperament, what we will call personality, and then parents, it being an hereditary disease. So he's kind of got a fairly long list. And then let's keep going with the outward causes, uh, which includes nurses and education, terrors, affrights, um, loss of liberty, poverty and want, all possible accidents, death of friends, and then inward, in which the body is weakened, the malady is cured, et cetera, of particular distempers, of brain, heart, spleen, liver, pylorus, stomach, et cetera. And then we have the three kinds, and I'll, I will end this eventually, of head melancholy, and here we have an eight humor, uh, a hot brain, corrupt blood in the brain, excess of venery or defect, agues, diseases, um, and fumes arising from the stomach. Okay? And then we have the heat of the sun, a blow to the head, overmuch hot wine, spices, garlics, hot baths, overmuch waking, uh, solitariness, overmuch study, so be careful, professors, uh, relevant nature, passions, perturbations. Um, and then we have defaults of spleen, Hemorrhoids, hemorrhoids, uh, other problems with evacuation, liver distemper, diet suppression, and one more, and I'll be done with this momentarily. Uh, we have here bread, coarse black bread, drinks, uh, uh, water unclean, um, filth, all kinds of filth, hard filth, herbs, cabbage, garlic, because we're aware of garlic, all roots, raw fruits, preparing, drilling, disorders of eating, etc. So you get the point. So actually, this is a very long list, and imagine if we were to do a path diagram of all these possible causes, how they would relate. Now, wh what is the point of this? It is somewhat humorous, and by the way, it's a fascinating book to read, and uh, it is absolutely encyclopedic. Um, it's rather hard to read from cover to cover. I can't say I've quite done that, but I've read large parts of it, and it's, uh, it contains quite a bit of wisdom, as well as a very broad view of the etiology of major depression. So. It, do I do this to illustrate, and this is a point that many have made, Gehrman Berrios is really sort of my, uh, my, my main source if I want to turn to someone about the history of psychiatric illness and the history of medical illness, and basically he and others have written that more or less before the middle of the 19th century, we barely had the idea that disorders have etiologies as the way we understood them. They had a series of these possible causes, but you look at them, there are all these long lists of every possible category across all ranges, with the idea that there was an underlying etiology that you're tapping into is actually really quite foreign. So the transformative experience of modern medicine was really the discovery of bacteria in the mid to late 19th century. And then we move from a point of lists of things like this to this stunning, and it must have been one of the most exciting periods in the history of medicine when Pasteur and Koch, one after the other, cholera, plague, tuberculosis, uh, diphtheria, one after the other of these great complex diseases, killers, including uh, disorders like tertiary syphilis, tuberculosis was thought to be genetic, it was thought to be social, there were all these huge debates, 
And all of a sudden, we had these hard etiologies of disorder. In my view, and this is supported by scholars you know, much more profoundly learned than me, that the idea of hard reductionist models in biomedicine as a whole really stemmed from this period of what would many would regard as the most exciting period in the history of biomedicine. As we made more difference in the problems of life, because of course many of these very quickly led to immunizations and, and much of the drive for uh, uh, sanitation and others come out of this overall period. And of course it had a tremendous impact on the then nascent field of, um, of psychiatry. I would recommend for those of you interested this lovely book by Carter, The Rise of Causal Concepts of Disease, that really explored this in more detail. <coughs> This set off within medicine in general, and of course within psychiatry, what I would describe as a reductionist feeding frenzy. That is, to be the current best academic doctor, you wanted to grab single causes for diseases, because that is what was trumpeted by the then dominant laboratory-based models. Remember, as we move from the sort of French hospital-based school of medicine in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, scientific medicine shifted dramatically into the German model, where the lab was, was the goal, and bacteria was the goal of that, and we were going to get single causes of diseases. This was the legitimate approach. This was the high prestige approach. And remember, modern neuropsychiatry really grew up almost entirely in Germany in the last third of the uh, 19th century and the first 20 years of, of the 20th century. And psychiatry, then a nascent discipline, and as always, a low prestige medical discipline, we wanted to out you know, uh, uh, formal etiology others. And so we, of course, were very strongly urged to find single etiologic theories to show that our disorders were really legitimate and they could stand up to, to plague or pneumonia as a model. So my box score of how that process is done is actually pretty negative. So actually, this one I created, roughly, we have one overwhelming success story. Bale began, actually, in front of Esquero in the 1820s to first say, you know, I've got this group of patients. They seem to they get neurologic symptoms earlier. They die faster than the other insane people. And by the way, when you open up their brains, they had no histopathology then. I see that their brains are somewhat shrunken and they're inflamed. And that, of course, was the very first description of what we now call tertiary syphilis. You fast forward to 1913 when Noguchi definitively identified the trepanin pallidum, and Kreplin was really key. So this is the one time when we've taken what in the 19th century was a classic neuro, neuropsychiatric disorder, some estimates of filling 30% of all the hospital beds in Western Europe, and showed that it had a single etiology. But let's take the other three. I, I put in pellagra, but it's actually false, because pellagra was never honestly considered to be a major psychiatric disorder. So from my perspective, we have three major historical iterations where we tried running up the ramp post to say, this is the single etiologies, and we're going to be like real doctors, and we're going to discover disorders that have single heart etiologies. And the first of that, of course, was neuropathology. And the first person to do that was when Kreplin set up his institute. The first, you know, his lifelong ambition was to have this integrated research institute funded in Munich. He hired this young psychiatrist neuropathologist by the name of Louis Alzheimer. And Alzheimer's job was to do all the pathology on every person who died in the nearby psychiatric hospital with the expectation that the kinds of neuropathological findings that were coming out of other classes of degenerative neurological disorders in the late 19th century would be found for psychiatry, particularly dementia precox, and of course that failed. There was a series of publications, a little bit of nonspecific lenosis there, a little bit of shrinkage, but there was never, and to this date, no specific neuropathology of schizophrenia. The next story, which occurred right around the time that I entered into psychiatry, was with the first histofluorescence studies of the monoamines. Remember? Never norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine. A few of you may have as much white hair as I do can remember, but it's embarrassing to say, when I was a first year resident at a distinguished psychiatric institution, Yale University, as a resident, I was really taught one synapse psychiatry. Once we had the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, and too much dopamine caused schizophrenia, and too little caused uh, depression, and too much. And uh, it's, I mean, it's complete bullshit. Um, <laughs> And we should have known it then. I, you know, that's why I bailed out of that research fairly soon. But that was, in my view, and I've written a long history of the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, it was really self-delusion. And what, what drove that? Well, it's not an accident that about three years before this all hit, Hornikevich did the first neuropathology showing that Parkinson's disease had clear deterioration in the basal ganglia. It was due to dopamine and psychiatry. You know, we wanted to get away from psychoanalysis. We wanted to be real scientists. We sort of rushed into the breach, and now the monoamines are going to explain everything in a single way. 
And then, of course, I have lived through the fervent phase where Mendelian genetics. So in addition to bacteria, the other paradigmatic single cause disorders in the medical lexicon are Mendelian disorders, where really most of what you need to know are the mutations that occur at a base pair level. And I remember vividly at that point when I was beginning to do work myself, I would travel around and give grand rounds, and they'd put me up with a 34-year-old assistant professor who had his three pedigrees of bipolar illness, and he was, and he was telling me he was going to find the gene. He was about ready to buy his tickets to Stockholm, and you know, everything was just going to be a few moments away, and we we're going to have this linkage. It was the same self-delusion of us, again, wanting to take very complex disorders and hoping, as that German model, the bacteriological, the Mendelian model had proposed, would work in these other fields. So I do think that that perspective is actually helpful. You know, it is psychologically understandable. We want to be a legitimate medical discipline. We want to be proud of the science to find these kind of causes. I just think that that's a misperception of the way reality really works. And at some point, we really have to recognize that. And that's sort of how this relates to my broader theory. OK, so that's really done with the historical interlude. Um, I don't know if I skipped that. So, so I just what I wanted to show you is Epidemiology, by the way, has gone through the same process. So I've also been reading the history of epidemiology. Of course, it began by studying single cause epidemics. Then somebody more or less realized, well, you know, when plague or diphtheria sweeps through, a lot of people get ill, but some don't. And so we have to worry about these concepts of differential resistance. The general model there was seed and soil models. But then with the start of the Framingham study, the beginnings of concepts of risk factors, these ideas of webs of causation, that now epidemiology has moved that most of the chronic diseases in a psychiatric disorders or anything, the vast majority of the chronic, are highly multifactorial. So that epidemiology itself has grown into realizing that if you're going to understand things like hypertension and coronary artery disease and type 2 diabetes and obesity, single causes don't make it. We really have to think about how we both develop, measure, integrate uh, conceptually, statistically complex webs of causation. Uh, and in fact, they tend to use this uh, particular w word of webs. Um, so that's being very well, well recognized. And I just sort of went through, I spent a, an hour on the web trying to find epidemiologic models, particularly looking at coronary artery disease, and you come up with models like this. So the idea that epidemiology has well recognized that many of the conditions we have are multi-causal, and you get pretty diagrams like this. The content of this is not at all important, or complex things like this. So this is really where modern epidemiology and biomedicine of complex diseases are. So I would ask you as a thought experiment, if we get this level of complexity with the control of circulation and clotting in a coronary artery, those past three were for coronary artery disease, could we possibly imagine that the etiology of psychiatric disorders would be simpler? Now, and of course, it is possible that there would be single causes, but I ask you really to step back and look at the overall plausibility. Think about our end organ. The heart, arteries are marvelous, but they are not built to learn like the mind-brain system is. They're not capable of higher cognitive functions. They're not capable of self-reflection. At the level of biology, while well, coronary arteries and, and, and uh, clotting cascades and cholesterol synthesis are all complicated, they, of course, are dwarfed by the complexity of the mind-brain system. So I think just from the a priori idea that we're going to expect we get these single, really robust causes that blast through this complexity, I begin from the skeptical position that that's just simply unlikely. So what this really raises, and this will come up again and again in this talk and hopefully the discussion after, is whether the multifactorial nature of what we know now about psychiatric disorders is a result of ignorance. So are there major causes? Are we going to find more treponine pallidum? Are we going to find other kinds of psychiatric disorders that we have been ignorant about where we have these single robust causes? Or is the multifactorial nature of these disorders an inherent property of the syndromes themselves? And I've debated this off and off. Of course, you can't predict the future of science. My intuitions much favor the latter position. So we'll sort of take that as given. And now let's go on to the main topic. OK, so I first want to talk about this paper. I think this was 2012. And this is the first part of my talk will be, as I said, about psychiatric nosology. Uh, this had a very simple origin, uh, which is that I, and I, I talked a little bit about this yesterday, I got tired of being mostly at psychiatric genetics congresses. And I would see young individuals, usually molecular geneticists, just occasionally young psychiatrists. And at that point, 
the sense of pride of these early molecular geneticists. They were going to solve these problems. It was just around the corner, give them another pedigree size. And when the, when the cost of genotyping would drop, all these psychiatric problems would dissolve away with the insights of molecular genetics. But the basic concept was, well, just wait till we make this particular advance in imaging or genetics. Then we'll get at the heart of these disorders, and we'll have the real diseases, and we can get rid of all this sort of DSM bullshit. You know, we're going to give us the science, and all these disorders are just going to fall out in a natural way. So what, what they were articulating is the desire for our diagnoses to be based on etiologies. The RDOC, those of you who are familiar with the NIMH initiative, the research diagnostic um, uh, criteria here, the implicit claim is about the right level. So what I wanted to do in this project is a little experiment about if we wanted to say that psychiatric disorders could have clear etiologic levels, how would we figure out the right level of explanation to apply. Okay? The metaphor is roughly this. That is that there are some conditions where the way the world is structured is like an hourglass, in which there's one little narrow point where you can grab that, and that information at that narrow point gives you most of the etiologic factors that you want for the disease. And of course, the obvious example would be Mendel Winter Fluid, that once you know the kinds of base pair substitutions that arise out of classic Mendelian disorders, there are a few other things to understand, but the vast majority of that information will come from that, as opposed to the idea that there is no hourglass, and that instead you have these steps of information, and you can't get at everything you want to know from a single overall perspective. That's the overall contrast that I'm trying to make. So the point is then levels of explanation. I can skip through this. So if you get psychiatrists in a room of a diverse orientation and they say, okay, our job is to try to find the etiology of psychiatric disorders, tell me what's the right level for us to address them. And what you would get is a profusion of possible responses. And this is a small example. Neuropathology, intrapsychic mechanisms, neurochemistry, molecular genetics, molecular neuroscience, systems neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, latent genetic factors, temperament, environmental stressors, family processes, social cultural processes. Uh, there would be advocates within our areas that each would claim that the essence of psychiatric disorders could be understood from this single perspective. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, there could be a single etiology spirochete-like. I want, now want to look in a detailed way at how well this model might work. Of that is grabbing a single form of explanation and seeing whether it can explain everything we want to know about a psychiatric disorder. So what I set up is I looked through the philosophy of science literature and I set up criteria for what we want for a good scientific explanation. Kuhn writes about this, Larry Lawton writes about this, many, many others, and there's nothing particularly complete about that, and in fact, I will spend very little time about this. I simply decided I was going to look for patterns of explanation that were strong, actually they had important etiologic impact, they, we had good confidence that it was causal and not correlative, that it tended to be generalizable, it wasn't only true in one particular environment, but it was broadly uh, applicable, applicable, it was specific to the disorder and not very broad, I could manipulate it and hence it had therapeutic potential, it was proximal in a causal chain, and it really was generative because it could help with a research program. That was sort of the, the way I set this project up. And then I said, well, let's give these theories a dry run by looking at the cystic fibrosis gene, which I would argue is kind of the classic place within medicine where you can grab an explanation and how well does that work at being the place at which you want to understand the etiology of the disorder. And if we see that was true, then I want to do a dry run with alcohol use disorders or alcohol dependence and see how well it worked. And here, this is the entire result of the project is well summarized here. So if you take the uh, variance uh, at the cystic fibrosis tram transmembrane conductance regulator gene, this one, what you find is that, of course, those are immensely strong risk factors. Their causal role was unambiguous. It's absolutely generalizable. You'll get that from cystic fibrosis if you live in the Aleutian Islands or in Antarctica or in any other possible environment. It really doesn't matter. Uh, it's very specific. They don't cause any other single disease. Manipulable is a little harder. There's been gene therapies, trying to correct them, trying to put in uh, proper mutations. That's been a little more difficult. It's very proximal. You can understand the physiology from this, and uh, it's very generative, because all kinds of research programs are already going from this. So, so for this particular example, as I expected, 
this is the bottleneck. This is the sort of point where we get a tremendous causal power from one scientific level. But let's look at alcohol dependence. So here we've got latent genetic risk. I've done a bunch of these twin studies myself. It's certainly strong. It's got a causal role. It's not very generalizable. It's not specific. It turns out that these latent genetic risks predispose to crime. They predispose to drug abuse. It's not specific to alcohol. They, we can't manipulate them at all. They're very distal on the process, and they're latent. They're not even, you can't measure the genes themselves. We can look at one really well understood genetic variant, which is the ALDH receptor that, where that causes the flushing reaction in East Asians. Uh, and what you find is it's really strong, it's really causal, but it's not generalizable. That's not a variant that actually segregates in non-Asian populations. I'm not going to go through this in all detail, but you can see that I tracked the major other kinds of risk factors, and not a single one of them was anything like cystic fibrosis. It was good in certain areas and not good in others. Impulsivity is a great predictor, but it's completely nonspecific. Impulsivity predicts all kinds of other things. So the point here is that while for cystic fibrosis, we have a single clear level of etiology, for this kind of disorder, we basically have a hodgepodge. That we have risk factors that are good in this area, but not that. This one is due to that one and not this. So do we have, or could we agree as a discipline and say, all right, we're going to figure out an etiologic level to define these disorders that's going to be anything like what DNA is for Mendelian disorders. And I think the answer to this exercise is no. And it's not because we're stupid or that our science is terrifically bad, I think the evidence simply suggests that the risk factors are sprinkled across multiple areas and they don't coalesce at one particular level of science that we can grab. And I can assure you that if we were to do this for other disorders, for major depression and others, the answer you get is very much the same. So that's really the outcome of this project. So I was simply saying, you know, everybody goes around, we want etiologic disorders only if our science gets mature, we want to get rid of all this descriptive psychiatry, it's around the corner, I actually think this is really pretty sobering because, in fact, if you want etiologic diagnoses, it's not at all clear what level and is there a level at which we can agree upon because if you, if you, want, if you say etiologic and you want neurochemistry and I say etiologic and I want neuropsychology and someone else says etiologic but I want genetic or I want brain anatomy, it's just going to be a mess. Um, and the science doesn't lead us in an unambiguous way to one level. All right, so now I want to switch to a very different topic. And this is my contributions to thinking in a processed way about what can we do in the process of psychiatric nosology to try to improve the process toward getting better and better indices or descriptions of psychiatric diagnoses. Let me start with this lovely quote. As evident from the history of science, a mature science's progress may be interpreted as asymptotic, coming closer and closer to the way the world really is. Here are the two major papers that I've written on this, although Hasek Chang's book is also quite important. So, epistemic iteration originates in mathematics as a computational method when using available data generates a series of increasingly accurate estimates of a desired parameter. All of my model fitting, the vast majority of model fitting that other people use, use an iterative mathematical process. In a properly working iterative system, mathematically speaking, each estimate improves upon its predecessor so that with sufficient number of iterations, the process will asymptote to the stable and accurate parameter estimates. That's how it should work. Iteration, when well done, and there's a variety of caveats and I'll go through these, should be robust. But given the key features that the likelihood surface over which it works is stable, you can start the iteration in many different places and they'll always converge toward a single solution. So it's a very generic, potentially powerful tool. And I'm going to give you, with my really high quality power graphics, a view of how epistemic iteration works. If you imagine that we are sitting here, let's say in DSM-3, and that's where we want to go with our diagnoses, and then we might see something like this right, that's DSM-4, that's DSM-5, that's DSM-6, and bingo, DSM-7. So only if it were that simple. Well, you can applaud, but it's a little premature at this point. Um, so what's important is what's going to make that system work. And I think this is where it's much more useful rather than a simple cartoon. So you need three things in my view. First, you have to have at least a moderately stable target. You have to be aiming more or less to the same point. 
I'm overstepping that. Second, the process of iteration needs to have some stability. Think about the aim. You've got to be aiming in more or less the same way, so you have to have stable rules. And third, the likelihood surface has to be fairly flat. Or I, I should say it would be sloping in one direction. If you get into what are called in statistics local minima, the system won't work. And I want to describe each of those in a little bit of detail. This originates from a lovely book that I strongly recommend by Hassak Chang called The Inventing Temperature, Measurement and Scientific Progress. And basically what Chang describes in both history and philosophy was what, how did you start with a thermometer? So imagine you're the first person who wants to measure something. And you get, you might say, let's say you observe that uh, gas expands when it's heated and contracts when it's cooled. And you say, all right, I take a, I take a glass tube, I stick some um, gas in it, um, and I um, take it out on a really cold day. And when it's really cold, I mark it there and I say, oh, that's a zero. And then I wait six months till a really hot day and I mark and that's 100. And then, you know, how do you improve on that? And let's say somebody said, well, I want to use mercury. I don't want to use air. I'm going to get oxygen. Or what happens when the, uh, when the air gets too cold and it doesn't compress? And so what Chang does is explain in a very practical way how the science of inventing temperatures work. And mostly what it did is the models keep getting better. And the epistemic iteration model really derived from that overall concept. He described it as a spiral of improvement. Um, and this is, again, just from a head-on view, what that process looks like. So very, very simple. Yeah. So what's the opposite of epistemic iteration? So what worries me, having now been a DSM warrior for a number of, uh, of iterations, is that it is a deep human characteristic to think that you are smarter than your predecessors, and that things they did, you can do better. So I was among the group where, one, you know, I was in the post-lithium generation, you generous psychiatrists, and when I was a resident, we with glee would take these notes of clinicians much older and wiser than us, who would call people schizophrenia and say, oh, those ignorant folks, this person really had bipolar illness, and we would give them lithium trials. And in fact, the joke was, that when you were on our unit, if you made one long distance phone call, that got you a lithium trial. So we were sort of, you know, we were ready for anything. And we made fun of the older generation because we were really up and hip. I think that's a process of, of general human culture. You know, hair goes up and down, beards, you know, pose in one generation rebels against the other. And Kavali Schwartz has modeled that kind of thing. And DSM is much at risk for that sort of thing because I want to come in and make my change, and of course I make a change by trying to argue that the, ne that the previous generation was really stupid and made, made other problems. I struggled and struggled to try to get an empirical example of this, and I was very pleased when I came up with this uh, title, quote, three centuries of women's dress fashions, a quantitative analysis, okay? And I have to quote from this. They note a series of irregular cycles with the periods of maximum length seen in 1641 to 60, 1794, there are also times of short skirts, by far the most striking of which is seen in 1927, think of flappers. And here I love this last quote. I have to quote the authors here, quote, at this time, skirts nearly reach the upper limit of possibility and probably are less definable limits of decency. Now you're not allowed to read ahead when I'm reading these. So this is what it looks like over time. That's the flappers up there. So they hadn't yet seen the miniskirt. I assume the miniskirt would be maybe even a little bit more on that. So I have actually argued with psychiatric nosologists, say, all right, you don't want to follow something like epistemic iteration. Is this what you want for DSM? Right, just each generation is going to rebel against the next. Borderline will be our cool diagnosis. Now this generation, then everything will be back to anxiety diagnosis. Or everything's going to be brain scans one generation, then the next one are going to look at things that are genetic, and then the next one we're going to look at neuropsychology, and we're just going to get bouncing around. There'll be no, there's no approximation. You don't center upon anything. And that's, you know, historians might argue about where, where, you, where the Renaissance ends and Reformation begins. Broad ties, even ties, is that what we want for this kind of science? So this is the idea of, of uh, what a random uh, walk is, and of course you're just chasing something. Every time you move, it's moving, and you're never going to get anywhere. It's just uh, it, it's random. So, that, so let me now pose, is epistemic iteration a viable model for psychiatric illness? When will it clearly not work? First, it'll clearly not work if psychiatric disorders are like fashions or social attitudes, and there is either no stable reality out there, and people certainly have argued that, there's no there there, I can't target it, 
temperature, thank goodness, you know, it's random molecular motion. It's a pretty stable thing out there in the world. Or, and this is, I mentioned last time, where I've moved from a very strong realistic perspective, it also works if you take a pragmatic or instrumental view. If you simply say, our job is to develop psychiatric diagnoses that really do a good job at telling you critical information about course and etiology and imaging and others, that you don't have to believe that there's something real in quotes out there, but you have to agree on something being stable. But if there's nothing stable out there, it'll automatically fail. And I actually, this, this is a very recent essay in which I delve into this. It's coming out in psychological medicine about trying to struggle with this idea and actually, for me, shifting more from a um, more um, a congruence kind of view um, uh, of truth to more, what you, you'll see in terms of the article about um, trying to argue for a more modest view of what a, a realistic view of mythology based on a coherence theory of truth. So second, epistemic iteration won't work if the methods used to move the progress process forward dramatically differ over time. And we are at great risk for this in psychiatry. In the temperature story, some scientists used mercury thermometers, others used air thermometers. They weren't the same, but they were highly intercorrelated. So it didn't send things off spiraling. But what would happen if the validating method, the empirical methods used to try it, changed dramatically over time? So this would, uh, I mean, this is again such an example in which if your arrow, if your focus changes, you're never going to get where you are. Um, and this is what I described before, which is that, again, trends of what is cool in psychiatry change. So if in the first generation we're so entranced with imaging and we want everything to deal with fu a functional MRI, 15 years later we want everything to be in line with molecular genetics, 15 years later it's going to be some new technology, and those are highly uncorrelated then things won't work. The deep question is, how often are these different validating perspectives telling us the same sort of thing? Okay. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, so, the last part, and I think the most profound, is that epistemic iteration will only work if our current diagnoses are more or less in the right ballpark. So what happens if our current views are so deficient of the underlying etiology that we can't get from here to there. This is actually sometimes in, 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 in uh, mathematical theory and iteration is called the box canyon problem. So those of you that used to watch westerns if you were young, you know, when the, when the bad guy rides into a canyon and this posse comes after him and then there's just all around him are high walls, he can't get out. So if that's going on, so our psychiatric disorders, we can't get to a better solution without coming up over the top of a ridge, what are we gonna do? Um, and I think that's probably the, the deepest of the concerns that we have, that our current concepts are sufficiently primitive. Let me show you the most simplistic kind of approach to that. So this is the idea of A is stuck within a, a, a local minimum and can't get up down to where he or she really needs to be in the diagnoses. And one approach is you do, and this is exactly what you do in statistical approaches, you do a reboot. You actually just take the starting point, drop it someplace else, and see if it works. So in this case, if we just moved the point A to there, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, we're back down in our mess. So this raises the issue about when can you do a reboot. At what point are psychiatric disorders so malfunctional, unable to be improved, and you have to say, we have to wipe the slate, the slate clean and start over again? This has been the major debate of the personality disorders within DSM-5. Those of you who know this history, it was an effort to do a reboot, and it failed for a variety of complex reasons. I know the intimate issues about this. Uh, we can talk about it in the discussion section if you want. I think it's a very important problem facing us about trying to understand under what circumstances we need reboots and then how they can be done in a way that, that, is, that is rigorous and brings broad consensus from the field, which certainly did not occur with personality disorders. Okay, so I am now shifting to the uh, second part of the talk, which is really trying to talk much more about the structure of psychiatric science. And here I really just have two projects to go through, this one quickly and then, then, then a second in the model. So the dappled nature of causes of psychiatric illness. This also came out in 2011. Um, So um, this has been, I think, a very helpful chain in my thinking. Let me describe again. This was also a thought experiment, a little bit like the last one. And here the thought experiment was much more trying to respond to this deep, what I think is dysfunctional structure within psychiatry of how often 
we consider things divided up into brain versus mind, or we slip into this very simple kind of computer logic about software and hardware. Uh, I am not a fan of this analogy, but I wanted, I wanted to try in a simple-minded way to broadly see whether we could test this cleanly. This began with the following intuition, which is that it is mostly true. I've talked to a few computer experts. It's not completely true. But when your laptop breaks and you call your IT person in, by and large, the differential diagnosis between it's a hardware problem or it's a software problem is very simple. It's almost always one or the other. And of course, the situation is the solutions are very different. If it's a software problem and your IT person reaches for his soldering gun and opens up your motherboard, you better be worried, right? On the other hand, if it's a, um, a hardware problem and he starts you know, going back into your code and trying to fix things, that isn't going to work as well. It's very seductive. I just think it's quite, quite uh, substantially flawed. The thought model was straightforward. I wanted to see if, in fact, mind-brain systems are like computers. We should simply very easily be able to take the causes of psychiatric disorders and divide them up into those that are basically software-based and those are hardware-based in the same kind of analogy. And would that, in fact, work? That was the simple approach. And I agree with that it's, um, uh, it's simple-mindedness. Could we, even with error or slop, broadly divide all the causes of psychiatric disorders into those two concepts, or either hardware or software? Or were, in fact, they dappled, by which I meant sprinkled across many levels of causation? So at this point, I really did a a priori review. I reviewed the literature, but not, as I said in a moment, in an entirely empirical manner. These are areas and disorders that I knew very well, and I, I as volunteered several times for other people to come after me. I gave myself 100 causal points, and then knowing these literatures, tried to assign them into these various categories from what might be the most reductive here to the sort of highest level here. And I tried to do this for schizophrenia, and I did this for major depression, and I did this for alcohol dependence. And the point only here is, first, these causes are highly dispersed, very similar to what we argued before. And I would rigorously defend the empirical quality of these results. I can quote particular studies, the overall magnitude of effects. And there might be some minor areas of debate, but I think most of these are, are really not open to wide interpretation. So that for all three of the disorders, it's highly dappled, but the dappling is quite different. So for example, in, uh, for alcoholism, social, cultural, and political factors are much more important. And for um, major depression, uh, both personality effects and trauma are more important. So the main result of this simple design is each pattern is different, but in each case you see the dappled nature of the causes across a wide variety of levels. Okay. Many limitations to this, we can discuss these. I didn't take into account mediational effects, because obviously some of those higher order effects are going to get mediated through, um, which would make this more complicated, and I have to start drawing all those path diagrams. I didn't want to go there, but I was really trying to make an illustrative So this brings me to the most recent uh, published of these philosophical projects. This came out in the American Journal a couple of months ago. And I want to spend a few more minutes on this and then conclude. Um, again, um, apologies for the hubris of the title. So I began with an empirical project. And in some sense, I was forced to do this by people asking me, well, you showed those a priori diagrams. How really realistic are they? So I set myself, and this was a fairly time-consuming task, I picked 12 journals that were representative across the major subfields of psychiatry. So this included journals like uh, psychiatric epidemiology and molecular uh, uh, psychiatry and all and British Journal of Psychiatry, Psychological Medicine, uh, JAMA Psychiatry, American Journal, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, et cetera, that are listed. I tried to be fairly broad in terms of representing uh, of different orientation. And I read through four issues of each of those journals. They had a complex coding system. So here my goal was basically sort of field work to say, OK, what actually is the field publishing? And I classified them into a nomenclature. And then I looked, how often were they single level versus actually doing work between levels? So that was the prime task. And after many, many hours, this is what I found. The total number was 197 articles. By the way, these were only etiology. So if it was treatment trials, uh, that was not part of it. So these were dealing with the etiology of, of psychiatric illness. So pretty diverse. Uh, not the same shape as what he said before. I wouldn't have expected it, of course. Uh, but what you can see, and what's particularly interesting, I quote this here, of the three most common single predictors, 
One came from psychology, which is neuropsychology right here. That happened to be actually very, very common. Right? The second most common was individual smoothing environment, this one right here, environmental exposures. And the third, as you can see, was systems neuroscience. So we've got really active investigations going on across this wide diversity of levels. Um, so, interestingly, of the 197 studies, about 70% of them examined a single level. And I will comment on why I think that's particularly important. Of the 62 multi-level studies, there were only three major groups of them. One, the most common studies that I do, look at twin studies, where you look at this latent A and a latent C and a latent E. And although that's multi-level, it's really cheating because these are just aggregate statistics. You're not actually looking in a dynamic way about how specific environments or genes interact. Five of them were basically doing the CASPI paradigm of looking at individual genetic variants in environment. And the only area where there was rigorous cross-level collaboration were between imaging studies and neuropsychology, in which people were really designing neuropsychological paradigms testing them and getting brain circuits involved and iterating back and forth. That was really the only active area in all of psychiatry and looking across them. So what would I suggest? I suggest that what we already are doing in our leading journals is practicing empirically based pluralism. And again, to deconstruct what that means, it means that we are willing to look anywhere in which we have rigorous evidence that these disorders relate to risk and that we don't have preconceptions that because it's social, it's got to be soft, and that's not real science, the only real science is neuroscience, or the only real science is neuropsychopharmacology, um, that we are entirely eclectic, as long as you are able to demonstrate strong empirical evidence that causal effect is there. So I, that was the descriptive part. So here is the proscriptive part on which I would end. So I have argued that we could see the task of psychiatric science as having three broadly consecutive paradigms. The first of which is the eclectic effort to clarify risk factors regardless of level with careful attention to causal inference. And I would recommend using this, the manipulation of the framework of Woodward. So here is a uh, effort that I did with John Campbell trying to show how attractive interventionist models. This is a form of counterfactualism, those of you familiar with this. It has the lovely properties of being completely agnostic to method. It works equally well in mind-based work, in brain-based work. It works across levels. It only requires that you make attempts to freeze other causal processes in the world, grab elements to manipulate, and see that something happens to your end result. So it doesn't involve physical causation, a whole additional philosophical scheme. And of course, there may be philosophers here much more deeply read in this complex area of causality. I can tell you, as a working psychiatrist, this is very attractive because it's aggregate, it works across all levels, and it focuses where it should at the problem of causal inference because psychiatrists, often like other social science researchers, are very sloppy about assuming correlations equal causation all the time. And this manipulationist framework forces you starkly to try to do better than that. And this, by the way, is, is Woodward's best book. It's really an interesting read. I mean, it's a little hard in places. These philosophers come up with these lovely models of each person shooting a person and who really kills them if they move and hits the apple. And they're these most macabre sort of examples of, of uh, how you might be able to kill someone without really meaning to. So they're all of that sort of ilk. And I, I, try, I don't analyze that in this uh, result. Um, so in some ways, the goal here would be to populate the causal space, trying to develop as full a range of predictors of psychiatric illness as possible. And so my goal here is a very simple one, which is to be broad-minded but empirically rigorous. And I think that's where an important differentiation might be from the way that Engel's traditional biopsychosocial model gets practiced, which is while it is broad-minded, the empirically rigorous part has really been left out. And it's sometimes used, in my view, as an excuse for sloppy mindedness. That is, if we just say that everything is important, that as clinicians we have to consider everything, I think it does us a disservice. Because the fact is, as I've showed you in those earlier slides, the, the patterns of risk factors are not the same for all of our disorders. There's some areas that are really not very important. We need to emphasize where the data suggests. So being broad minded is good, uh, but you have to include the empirically rigorous part. 
The second goal, and I think this is an area where we are drilling deeply in certain parts, is to clarify mechanisms of learning. So we start out with these individual pockets of knowing these bits. So George Brown spends 25 years of his life documenting how important stressful life events is, and it's beautiful work. But very often investigators, for a variety of reasons, are not incentivized, don't then try to take that work and begin to build it into more important etiological pathways. Um, often this involves tracing pathways across illness. As I talked about last time, often this involves non-additive effects. So this is difficult kind of work, but it is not going to help the field if we stay largely within our individual areas and drill down without trying to develop these into more complex causal pathways. You'd think that we are blind in this area? Absolutely not. There's a whole generation of philosophers of biology, very poorly read in the psychiatric sciences, um, uh, who have written extensively around these kinds of problems. I would say Darden, Bechtel, Craver, Wimsatt are the ones who particularly come to mind, and here are a couple of the books that have been most influential to me. The Carden and Darden book, In Search of Mechanisms, Carl Craver's lovely book about explaining the mind, Discovering Complexity, which was a very early work of Bechtel and Richardson. This is William Wimsatt's a lovely, occasionally obscure book, and this is one of Bechtel's series of mental mechanisms. We're not without clear guidance of very thoughtful people looking at complex biological problems. Bechtel goes, one of his uh, books is largely about a history of chemistry, where he said how in the 1880s and 1890s did they work out these cyclic uh, pathways, the Ebden Meyerhoff, the Krebs cycle, those who physicians in the audience have had to memorize multiple times when we get examined. So we really have a substantial philosophical framework that the field of psychiatry is really active in ignorance of. Uh, I, I very much feel that moving toward the more classic-based, physics-oriented philosophy of science is largely sterile for us. It is the philosophy of biology that is really our natural mates that can provide paradigms that are really quite helpful for us. But there are an important range of barriers. Funding is a critical problem. Research specialization and skepticism of other fields. I've had the personal experience as a psychiatric geneticist of wanting to go and start working in other areas, and I'm not a member of the club. You know, grant reviews first tend to get turned down. I haven't published 25 articles in this area. Uh, they, in fact, it makes doing this kind of synthetic work more difficult. I think that there is a deep problem within the field that many of these areas, especially as you begin to work across levels, require a level of statistical sophistication when you're thinking about modeling non-additive effects across levels, and often our research background, our research teams are not well equipped to deal with that sort of statistical complexity. Um, it's just plain difficult because we have these causal loops that we have, so this is not, I'm claiming to be easy work. And it's also hard to judge when the time is right. So let's take an example of Eric Kandel. You know, when he was looking around trying to clarify memory, everyone said, oh, you have to work in the rodent hippocampus. That's where everything's worked. And, and Kandel, with tremendous foresight and wisdom, said that's way too complicated. So he spent his life on the single synapses of the aplesia. And at that point, that was the right answer for him because he had to go down. But you're going down. If you're going to solve problems, you have to come back up. And sort of when in a career in the development of a science, our time's right. And my own view is that in many areas, we have to be spending time looking up and beginning to develop synthetic models, lest we should have a, we have a field full of these deeply dug holes of individual specialties without someone trying to begin to be integrated or trying to put all these processes together. As I said, Bechtel treats these in a number of ways. This raises very important issues about, decompos about a decomposition. So you start a problem, where do you divvy them up into tractable questions that you can individually answer, and when do those get answered sufficiently where you have to start moving from that one to the next one next door and bringing causal uh, links between them? That's a critical question as our science develops. Lander and Weinberg have given this beautiful quote uh, because systems biology actually describes many of the sorts of themes that I've been talking about. 20th century biology triumphed because of its focus on an intensive analysis of individual components of complex biological systems the 21st century discipline will focus increasingly on the study of entire biological systems by attempting to understand how component parts collaborate to create a whole. You can see how sympathetic that is to the kind of picture that I'm trying to create for the future of psychiatric research. Third major paradigm. So I hang around a lot with molecular geneticists, um, and I have gotten a good inculcated sense of what they see their goals as being. And roughly, it's that if they're able to demonstrate they get their 108 or their 150 variants 
and they show statistically rigorously that this relates to risk for schizophrenia, they really want to declare victory and head home. As if understanding the down levels, the risk is the end of the story. And I get into vigorous arguments with them that this is not right. So the third paradigm that I'm stressing is that we have to, to complete the circle within psychiatric research, go from the biological reductionist mechanism and bring it back up into mental processes. So that if you tell me, I hold a press conference, that I've discovered the cause of schizophrenia, right? And I tell you my 37 genes and the complex network and how it acts with synaptic migration and how neurons developing the second, I mean, I give you the whole biology. Then I'm going to be in the back of the room and I raise my hand and say, Dr. X, I know you're thinking about getting a Nobel Prize. Now, how does this explain delusions and hallucinations? And I guarantee you there will be this very awkward silence because these individuals have never considered that question. And my simple point is the job is not complete for us as a field until we take this lovely biological mechanism and track it back up. And it's not complete, first, because that's where we're going to learn some things more about etiology and prevention. But our obligation to our patients, and I feel this very deeply, you know, when, you, when my, my wife, a family practitioner, has a patient with diabetes for the first time, she sits down and she draws an islet cell and she draws a pancreas and she talks about sugar and she talks about circulation and she draws out for the person so that not everybody gets it the first time, but they come away with a basic understanding of why they got where they were and why the kinds of things they need to do, like watching the sugar at all relates. Our obligation in psychiatry someday, I'm not sure I'll live long enough, is when a patient with schizophrenia comes in, I can take a little diagram, and it's not you know, 37 million uh, neurons, it's giving them a basic explanation of the etiology of delusions and hallucinations because we understand it from the ground floor back up. So that's the third part. And we, in all of the kind of reduction of zealotry, lose those things out. So it's something that I feel personally that we as a field have to, have to be committed to. Um, there are already some important examples. So I think some of the work that Frith has done with the feed forward and motor systems and delusions of control that Kapoor have done with dopamine salience who are making some important inroads, mostly through neuropsychology being the loop between neurobiology on the one hand and expanding understanding on the other. Uh, this again is a paper that I've written, published, I guess, last year that very much looks at this question about how we can, and this is going back to Carl Jasper's idea of explanation and understanding, introducing the idea of explanation-aided understanding, how through advances in neurobiology, both we and our patients can understand from a subjective perspective why these phenomena are arising. So our work is not complete until we conclude that. Okay. So this is really just a summary. I don't think I need to do it. The time is out. I will end with this quote by Hasak Chang. I think this addresses what's the right word to say. We as a field, by which I mean mental health, not philosophy, have had a long pension of ideologically oriented zealotry in which one group of people are sure that there is, is the right way. And of course, it has been psychoanalysts, and it has been neurochemists, and it has been psychopharmacologists, and it has been molecular geneticists that this is the one way. And I think I've tried to describe to you all the fallacies of that, how that partially arises from our inability to deal with complexity, but it also deals from a fundamental hubris. I think Hassock Chain captures, in my view, very clearly the kind of mature pluralistic science that we want, I want psychiatry to be. I, I quote, I consider what it means for science to be mature and identify humility rather than hubris as the proper basis of maturity. The active realist ideal is not truth or certainty, but a continual and pluralistic pursuit of knowledge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that. Um, just let me sit down. <laughs>
um, a lot of what you're saying I is very applicable more broadly to developmental disorders, which is my field, and it's a delight to hear you emphasizing the, the multiplicity of risk factors and so on. But what I found myself thinking is when you said the, parent, the new um, prescription would be to go and look at these multiple risk factors, I found myself saying, risk for what? Because we have this problem that even categories like schizophrenia and depression, people are arguing they're not reliable, they're not valid. Um, so if you're going to do that, you have to decide what it is you're trying to predict too. And I'm just wondering you know, how you go about selecting a valid object for your risk studies. Well, that, that, of course, is a deep question. I think that right now, most of what we are doing best is by using the current nomenclature and then trying to get that better over time. And the problem is that when we, let, let me put it more succinctly, the studies, I think, because of the key issues of communicability across, need to include the DSM categories, but good researchers always have to include other important intermediate outcomes. So that is a way of both combining some of the positive benefits of the structured criteria, which mostly are communicability and standardization, with the realization they don't come close to having complete pictures about the variables. And um, a problem that I, that I didn't have time to talk about is one of the adverse effects of particularly the DSM is the idea of this reification of the criteria, as if all of a sudden the nine criteria for major depression are all anyone would want to know, and I'm afraid to say that when we operationalize and we go out and we do these big epidemiologic studies, what do we talk about? The nine criteria for major depression, so it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. So in the research programs that I've done, although sometimes grantors object, while the DSM are included, there's a much broader array of both symptomatology and other risk factors. So I think that is the most prudent way to pursue this area. I don't claim, you know, the DSMs are nowhere near where they need to be, but everyone thinking about their own approach is more chaotic and, and I think will impede progress. So it's a, it's a mixture, I think. get to hear the compliment twice now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was just an excellent set of lectures. That's been really fascinating. Um, you talked today about how um, the, the etiology of psychiatric illnesses is extremely complex, and more right. complex than people can't very specifically other um, traumatic diseases. And you've also talked about sort of uh, progress in psychiatry and moving forward. Um, and I wonder whether um, the fact that psychiatric illness is so etiologically complicated means that we might have to kind of rethink what progress in psychiatry is. Because at the moment, you've got these sort of, um, the environment changes all the time and things that sort of play such a big role. Might it be that um, managing psychiatric illness might be more like sort of uh, governing a country than um, sort of making progress in a Um, so, you know, just because governing a country, there's sort of things that will work well at certain times and in a certain culture um, and given a certain kind of background condition. But that might not work again, you know, even though some people are um, sort of in the environment that's sort of similar over time because the culture plays such a huge role. We, we, you know, we don't really think of progress in politics or in these other kinds of things the way that we should. Um, do you think that there might be, I mean, is, are, are we being just too ambitious I would not be so pessimistic. Um, so for example, we have been studying genetics of depression in Sweden, the United States, and China. The heritability is very similar across all three countries. The clinical symptomatology is relatively similar, despite especially wide cultural differences that we've seen. Um, so while I certainly agree with its complexity, I would be considerably more optimistic. First of all, the cross-cultural stability of the risk factors. So for example, in our large project in China, we looked at childhood sexual abuse, disruptive parent-child relationships, low social support, stressful life events, 
the standard eras or the estimates of those overlap with things we studied in Virginia. Now that doesn't mean there aren't important subtle cultural differences. Uh, the nature of phobias is different, uh, the attitudes towards suicidality. But if you look at the core features of the disorders, they're actually relatively uh, similar. And that's been true for example for schizophrenia. You know, I, I did a lot of studies in the United States. When I went to, to Ireland, I had to certainly learn the names of more saints than I'd ever learned before because you know this particular saint was talking to me from this part of my head and this one there, and they were slightly more sexually repressed, if you're pardon the expression. So masturbation was a more prominent theme among them than they all, but the nature of the illness was relatively similar. So I, I don't want to give a, uh, a reason for despair, but the opposite of that is this false optimism of kind of run in, grab the cause, you know, and charge off to Sweden for my Nobel Prize if I found the cause for schizophrenia. I think that that's more destructive. Um, you're a little bit like, but that's really not fair. There is the Mysterian approach that I commented on, which is sort of, oh, it's just so complicated, we can't possibly do stuff. I absolutely don't agree with that. I think the science, in terms of articulating, documented risk factors, understanding them, understanding their origins, we're certainly making important progress. Uh, I think this is more, psychiatric illness is gonna be much closer to things like essential hypertension, you know, to um, osteoporosis, to obesity. Uh, it's a little harder because we've got the brain added on with the self and the top-down causality, but those are issues that are extremely complex. We're making slow progress in understanding them, so I'd be a little more hopeful. Thank you very much. I, th I thought that was excellent. I particularly liked the, the, the slide that you put up about uh, explaining things in first-person language for reasons mm -hmm. that might become apparent in the, 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 the question I'm going to ask. But since you're there and since you're sitting up on stage and, and it's Oxford, we, we've, got, we've got to quiz you. So uh, as, I, as I read the sort of bullet point BBC article story of the talk, it goes, we're really, really bad at finding prognostic and etiological indicators for these major mental disorders. It then raised the issue that they might not indeed be disorders at all. And then, if you'll forgive me, slipped slightly past that. So I guess my question is, what if they aren't actually disorders at all? There are plenty of things, plenty of things we do, and I think alcohol use is very interesting. We abuse our children, we get involved in wars, we condemn people to poverty, we enslave people, we are violent towards 51% uh, um, of the population. There are loads of things that we do which are problems, social, psychological, political problems, that simply aren't illnesses, despite what some people have tried to label them in the past, but they're still problems that we need to understand and focus on. And I go further, maybe if we can't find etiological, prognostic uh, indicators of, of these issues, Maybe that's the empirical evidence that we need in order to conclude the first point, which is maybe there aren't illnesses at all. Uh, a profound question we talked a little bit about last time, uh, yesterday. So let me, let me give a couple of thoughts. I, I don't agree, I guess would be the, the most, most fundamental point. Um, so how do you think about disorders? First, are these conditions that cause a good deal of disability to people? I think we'd agree that that's the case. Um, are they disorders for which there is some evidence of dysfunction, either at a psychological or at a biological level? In most cases, that's true. Does it mean that they have to have clean boundaries? And I think that's, th we would like that for some disorders. I continue to feel, despite some research to the contrary, that the state of psychosis is really qualitatively clear. If you follow an individual as they begin to progress toward a delusional state, something often snaps when delusions occur and represents a true change of state, which I, I would argue for. Um, that these do represent moderately discrete categories that we can usefully articulate and that when assigning them provide additional important information about prognosis, about causes, and about background. Now, you could argue that something like essential hypertension shouldn't be a disorder or osteoporosis shouldn't be a disorder. Um, I think they're more like that. They're not like Mendelian disorders. I agree with that. If, if the goal or even more is an atomic element, you know, these absolutely clean, discrete, essential things, that for sure they're not. Um, but I think there is an intermediate category. I've written some about the idea of, of more, more like biological species, which I think is a much better model of these broad classes, but that is a quite useful conceptualization that has continued to help us. It does not look convinced, by the way, so it's not pure. But. I, I, I think that I think it might apply to poverty. Something snaps in my life, there's obvious consequences for, for my life. You can trace the etiology, you can trace the phenomena that, that poverty has contributed.
with my property? In, in what way is becoming depressed dissimilar to becoming poor? Well, I think that there is a uh, genetic and neurobiological substrate to depression that we can identify ahead of time that would differentiate it from with problems of poverty. And I, I, I could show you data to that effect, I think. This is, well, I expect we'll continue this afterwards, so it's, it's not the sort of thing that gets resolved in a brief interchange. I appreciate your civility, however. <laughs> Thank you. Um, th this is a somewhat related question. Um, you, you talked, I think, about the attempt to find uh, a synthetic paradigm that would integrate all the different explanatory levels. And it wasn't clear to me why you weren't considering an evolutionary perspective as being the potential synthetic paradigm that would do that. I certainly have read some of evolutionary psychology. I'm not especially an expert. I know more about Jerry Wakefield's attempts to define psychiatric disorders by being dysfunctions of evolved mechanisms. Um, I personally find them to be too vague to be very helpful, that we rarely have detailed information about the actual evolutionary forces that humans were subject to, that you commonly get these stories about, you know, what was man like and the Pleistocene and the plains of, in, of, uh, of Africa and what may or may not have happened. I have really myself in my own research found that terribly useful. I've read a lot about evolutionary theories of depression. None of them are very convincing. Phobias make a bit more sense. I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not, I've not been a serious scholar of that, so I don't claim that I've given a deep, deep critique, but intuitively for me that has not been a useful organizing principle. I've got a big portrait of Darwin in my office. I mean, I, I find his insights into genetics and other factors to be profound, but that we could use that as a linchpin for organizing psychiatry, I've not been convinced. So that's not a great answer, I admit it. Yeah, thank you for those uh, two excellent lectures. Uh, really great to hear. Um, I guess I have another pessimistic um, question or comment to make about, about treatment. So I guess the one thought was, um, given the rich array of etiologies you, you described at multiple levels, um, can we assume that etiological knowledge will help us with interventions? This is, is the one idea. And I guess the other thought was in my head was should we constrain our search for etiologies based upon the likely interventions we may develop? I guess, should we be looking for causes that we can't um, mechanistically interface with or would be not? Well, I think the second question is easier. That is, from the perspective of were I sitting and looking at uh, debating the, uh, the budget for the National Institutes of Mental Health, I think from a public health perspective, it is certainly sensible to prioritize funding toward etiologic processes that might have greater impact on prevention or treatment, not treatment alone. But because there is innate unpredictabilities in the nature of medicine to eliminate uh, areas of research, because I couldn't see how they might impact on treatment or prevention would be a grave error. So I think a little bit of waiting would be possible um, because I think we've seen over and over again uh, how unanticipated areas arise. Now, the first question, remind me again, was the... I guess it's, it's, should we always assume that the cause is also a, a, a window for intervention? Because that's the way <coughs> queries are being answered. I think the, the, that, that cannot be true. Okay. Um, you know, the best example is... Uh, so I, I had a conversation during the very heady days in the 1990s when we were doing early linkage analyses and people thought we were going to very quickly get to gene variants. Um, and a, a major uh, executive of a major pharmaceutical company sort of sidled up to me and said something to the effect of, well, do you know, Dr. Ken Lowe, when, when you or anyone else publishes a, a major gene finding in schizophrenia, I'm going to have 500 scientists you know, working on it the next day trying to make a patentable molecule that I can then get as a treatment. But what he said was that this is a complete crapshoot. So let's happen, assume that the major gene for schizophrenia is something that influenced migration of neurons in the fourth and fifth month of pregnancy and then shuts down. So we've discovered the etiology and we've got a completely set hardware that with your 34-year-old individual schizophrenia, you can't possibly impact. So that's the worst case scenario. 
The best case scenario is you give me a gene that is an enzyme that's really active and that doesn't produce lots of deteriorative functions in the rest of the action. And I take my fancy computer models and I get it, I want to say this receptor, it's got a little pocket there, it's not working. And I get a molecule, snaps that back in, the patient wakes up and the schizophrenia is cured. That's the superb model. The reality, of course, is much more likely to win in between. And the reality is we have no idea which is true. So I don't, I think we have to pursue them without knowing because we can't ahead of time the degree to which understanding will readily translate. You know, I am reminded that the statins, and this is not work I, I really know that much about, but the statins, which are now, I think, the most widely prescribed uh, drug in the United States that have been so successful at lowering cholesterol, were actually discovered as a minor little offshoot in a, in a metabolic study about, um, about uh, uh, cholesterol levels. And that, that another criticism we get, I'll, this is, I admit, is a digression, is that people say, well, why could you possibly be studying GWAS? Because all these genes have such tiny little effects. And the response is, there is no necessary relationship between the effect size of an etiologic agent and a pharmaceutical drug that might tag other parts of that system. It could be doing a little thing in nature, but of course, drugs describe biologies outside the bounds of nature, and you can't relate one to the other. So that's a really good question. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'll ask a bit more about how epistemic iteration is supposed to work. Um, so I guess the worry is, is that a research group, they might get stuck at a local minima, and then you say to them, well, the three groups near you. Have you got any thoughts as to how you know when you're stuck at no local minima? <laughs> um, I, I think that it could not work at a local research group level. That would be my sense. So that the reboot is going to work when the field as a whole figures out that they're stuck, and then begins to develop a reboot, and then collects enough data about that rebooted version, when they've hopped over that ledge, that that new set of criteria that may be quite conceptually different outperform what they did before. And the, the, although it is a very complex story, the simple story about the failure of the personality disorder criteria in DSM-5 is that they had this elegant model the big five, if any of you know it, this, you know, uh, um, five dimensions of personality, very widely accepted among psychologists, usually a fairly contentious lot, but most of them agree that this is the best way to describe personality. And there's a reasonable amount of evidence that that dimension of normative personality maps onto pathological personality. So they, that's kind of nice, and they did a bunch of pretty fact analyses. So they basically threw out all of the DSM definitions, devised personality abnormalities based on items from this big five pathological dimension, and then presented that to the DSM at no point having actually tested these scales, gone out, studied new patients, showed that they performed better, and they felt that their a priori argument, which is that the big five is, a, is very widely supported, was sufficient to carry the day. And it was just this clash of cultures, that they were talking about factor analyses, the psychiatric community was, but you have no data showing that this is performing better, and it, it really is a train wreck. Um, so the, the issue then is if you as a field decide you have to reboot it, you have to design the reboot, and then either on your own support or getting grant support, which you have to convince other people, show that the reboot really does a better job, which m certainly might be the case, because the DSM criteria is a pretty arbitrary rag map. So that's, I think, the biggest issue. It's usually not going to be something that individual groups are going to need to decide because the resources to do that are broader. Thank you very much for the talk again. Um, just a comment on what you said towards the end. So if the, the research of the 20th century, in a way, came to, to a point where it can't move anymore, and you said the 21st century uh, research will have to be more systems and more complexity. Uh, wh what type of experiments do you think would be more relevant to that process? And I mean, what kind of research methodology do you think would be more important? And especially uh, about what you said about going down first and then going up again. Uh, do you think perhaps case studies will become a bit more relevant? Because in a case study, perhaps you have more ability to, to mu study multiple systems and come up with meaningful um, explanations that are relevant to the patients as well. Just a comment on that. Um, that wouldn't be my guess. Uh, I think my first reaction would be I am a very uh, deep advocate of longitudinal studies of development. 
but of course what has happened is that the things that we funded are basically like the stuff I've done, all paper and pencil based. So you know, I can tell you all about your personality and your stressful life event. I have no good biological measures. I have no good measures of important neuropsychological processes. So one of the most important avenues, and of course these are fairly expensive, is building integrative teams that can look at key populations and measure them deeply, thoughtfully from multiple perspectives and follow that group over time um, and develop really integrative models that can iterate back up to social factors, right? You know, mom gets depressed, dad drinks, parenting patterns change, neuropsychological features are gonna change in the kid, the biology changes, do you wanna be able to begin? And we, don't, we literally don't have the databases to answer those questions because we're all, you know, somebody does all the dexamethasone suppression, or they do imaging, they follow people, somebody else does others. The NIH has tried occasionally to wrap their arms and get people to collaborate, but that would be one of the actions. We, we, the research groups rarely try to design studies like that. They prefer to work in areas. There are many other examples, but for me, that would be one of the most important. Uh, thank you for your very enjoyable lecture. I found your uh, plea for a pluralist iterative approach uh, very, very persuasive. Um, but as you said, this iterative approach depends upon the disorders you're uh, seeking to understand being some sort of kinds which are well-defined things to be trying to, uh, to explain. And I wonder whether from the viewpoint of adult psychiatry, you see particular areas where you think diagnostic systems are not really working well and potentially seeking people to study things that aren't the best things to be trying to explain. Um, depends on what you mean by working well, of course. I think my main reaction is going to be very similar to the prior question, which is that because we want to be able to gather aggregate data, which is so important for a cumulative science, right? So, you know, I've read enough of what it was like to do schizophrenia research in the 1920s and 1930s, and you had the Kretschmerian schizophrenia, and you had the Boilerian schizophrenia, and you had the Langfeldian and Fitzgerald, and you had the Boyle and the Kreplinian and the Schneiderian, and you sort of had some vague idea, but it was really a cacophony, that DSM is by no means perfect, but there is some increased standardization but don't restrict what you're studying to those individual criteria and, and enlarge them and measure more. And that's really a struggle. In, in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, a lot of people, you know, you got a lot of people to study. You do, as I've said the word before, you may, you're familiar with what Walmart is here? Any familiar with Kingdom? So, so what I call, that's Walmart genetics, right? You just, you take the absolute minimum, you push for maximum sample size, and you just, you, know, you do your 15 or 20 minute interview, you do your quick checklist, and that's how you get big samples, but then you're boxed in because you can't ask, ask the important follow-up questions. So I think the change of culture that I would enforce is not to abandon the categories, but to use them as one framework to centrally communicate. So you can then publish. You know, I studied X number of DSM, I found this, and look, as we're seeing in our China study, when we switch from major depression to melancholia, we get a lot stronger genetic signals, for example. And then when we look at postpartum depression, or we look at a Beckian depression where helplessness and hopelessness and worthlessness, which in that particular sample strongly loads in suicidality, we get other signals there. That's the kind that I would argue for, to give yourself a rich panoply from which to work from that doesn't restrict, but doesn't go back to the kind of pre-diagnostic aims. These are all imperfect. Major depression, you know, if you look at its validators, it does pretty well. It's too common for my basis. It's too easy to make the criteria. But we've learned a lot about it, and I, I think we underestimate the value of that accumulated information. It's easy to bash. You know, criticizing psychiatry is not very hard. But if you look at what we've accumulated over time, I think that we can underestimate that from what we found. Thanks. Thank you. That's very brilliant uh, and illuminating. Uh, journey through different levels, particularly going down and going across. Right. Um, I'm also very sympathetic to your uh, um, uh, hope and, and, and uh, uh, proposition that we should be looking up. And 
uh, I'm reminded of a New Yorker cartoon a little while ago, quite a while ago now today, in which um, you may have seen the scientists do, uh, mathematicians were standing in front of a big blackboard and drawing a very long and complex um, formula down to the end. At the very end of it, one of them says to the other, uh, and at this point a miracle happens. <laughs> um, at earlier on in your talk, you spoke of yourself as, as agnostic on the, or you wrote of yourself as agnostic on the mind-brain uh, issue. Could you say where you stand on that one now? Are you still agnostic, or are you beginning to think that at some point a miracle will have to happen? Oh boy, I thought I might get. <laughs> um, I, I would. I, I think I clearly fall into the sort of emerging physicalist camp, roughly. So I certainly, I avidly, uh, deeply uh, dis. Well, dislike is strong. Uh, I think Cartesian dualism has done a great disservice to psychiatry. And I am repeatedly impressed, and I recommend for any of you who want to play the game of the anthropologist, just go in to psychiatric rounds or lectures and see how much the ghost of Descartes kind of hovers over this, how often we so easily think about, we do the biology and then we do the psychology as if we're sort of enforced in that way. I believe in the emergence of complex systems, but I'm not a mysterian. I think there are many very difficult points I don't think that currently we have any tractable way of reducing higher orders of consciousness. I'm not saying it's impossible, and I must say I, I am impatient. So what differentiates me from professional philosophers is that if you get into arguments about, you know, is it theoretically ever possible that we will be able to look into your brain with super duper MRI scanner number 3476 and tell everything you're thinking about, I don't give a damn. Um, what, what is clear to me is that for the next, certainly for my scientific life, by talking to people and learning their own introspective aspects, we learn terribly valuable things about how their mind-brain functions, that Beckian therapy is based on those processes. Um, and I'm also not interested in the ontological questions. I think the epistemic questions are much more important. And right now, we want to learn absolutely critical things about what goes on in psychiatric patients. You ask them. And you ask them thoughtfully and sensitively, and maybe someday that might not be the case, but I don't really get upset about that. So that's my more pragmatic view about the mind-body problem. Thank you for that, and uh, <laughs> the, the timing I think is good. You know, I, I want to uh, take us to, to the bedside, if you will, to the, to the consulting room um, where we have patients who are suffering, and we're trying to figure out what, what do we do to help this person? You know, and if someone comes to me and they say, you know, Dr. So-and-so gave me this drug and it made me kind of sick, and Dr. So-and-so gave me that drug and it didn't do anything at all. Um, I'm a little bit better in this drug, but not well enough. Please help me. So my training tells me, all right, so we're talking about a biological treatment for what is a condition that undoubtedly has some very substantial biological determinants. And uh, my training also tells me, get to know this person, how they think, how they address problems, how they think about other people in their lives and themselves over time, and then uh, don't forget the context in which all this has occurred. So in the course of my work with this person, I will find myself at different times emphasizing one or the other or two of the three of these areas. I don't think that by endorsing the biopsychosocial model, we are saying all three are equal. I do think we are saying never forget the biology, the psychology, the environment, and perhaps the spiritual as well as a component of perhaps all three, depending on how you look at it. Um, do you think there is guidance for clinicians in our discussions of this evening and yesterday could you elaborate on that a bit more? Um, and um, I think what you just said to Dr. Lobel, of course, is that you are optimistic that by continuing to talk to patients, we will continue to elucidate these problems as long as we also continue to image them and to inspect their synapses and their neural circuitry and their systems of neural interaction. 
It's a very good question. I have to say this is a question which I have much less deep expertise. I'm a moderately experienced clinician. In fact, I haven't seen patients for 10 years because I've been so busy in other areas. I do teach residents. So let me give you really much more my off-the-cuff thoughts. I teach a course to introductory residents where I use the book Perspectives of Psychiatry. And what that talks about is how you as a clinician have to be like an anthropologist who keeps switching glasses back and forth. And I, I actually, when I talk to philosophers, I say, you want to know somebody who lives the mind-body problem? It is the psychiatrist. So how, when you're caring for a woman, let's say who had a recurrent depressive illness, context of marital difficulties, um, and in that same hour, you're thinking about, well, what's happening to the side effects of your serotonin receptor? You're thinking about intrapsychic things. You're thinking about support levels. And that good quality psychiatry, and believe me, that's not always the case that you get is someone who can rapidly move back and forth in levels and see from the perspectives. And it's really different. You see a crazy patient in the emergency room, you don't worry about psychological and psychodynamic problems. You have to control that person behaviorally. Six months later, that same person might be sitting in your office, moderately compensated from a schizophrenic illness, and what he really wants to know is he's met this pretty girl at the halfway house, and could he call her up for a date? And he's so nervous, and what you are is the older brother or the father who kind of talks him through. And he may also then mention that, gee, these, you know, he's got these funny thoughts again, and he wants to tell a supervisor, and you may give him some counseling about whether it is or isn't good, and your role shifts back and forth. And high-quality psychiatrists, no matter which their original persuasion, the psychoanalyst, the biological psychiatrist practices that way. But we have these doctrinaire folks. They're sort of in their box. I give you my medicine, or I have to say psychoanalyst who will squeeze everything a clinician will say into an Oedipal or a pre -Oedipal. They do that. That's just plain bad psychiatry. So I'm absolutely empathetic with what you're saying. I think that there is a broad thematic similarity with what I'm doing, but it doesn't map one to one. That roughly what I'm trying to say from the perspective of a researcher is that high quality research needs to look across those individual domains we will give you, the clinician, some useful information about what things are important. Some of it, of course, is obvious, right? You know, so with individuals with severe autism, there's going to be parts of it which just aren't relevant to the process, the nature. So I, I think that in the long run, this kind of pluralistic psychiatric research can and will feed in to the more pluralistically informed psychiatric practice, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. I think at a level of would be the right word, healthy, critical eclecticism and skepticism, they share a worldview, roughly. Um, but often the people who practice them are really relatively disparate, for better or worse. So I hope that's your response. Thank you very much for sharing your vision. It, I think it's truly important. And um, I think many of us on the research side and on the clinical side have been trying to implement this biopsychosocial vision for some time. So. I suppose I want to ask you at the more pragmatic end, it's not a dissimilar question, but it's really on the research end. So um, in the EU and in the UK specifically, we have several funders who have really been trying to um, support interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. But I suppose what, what you didn't talk about was the politics of interdisciplinarity. No, I didn't. <laughs> and, um, you know, as, as somebody who sits on these funding panels, what I see again and again is that um, even an interdisciplinary panel that is really committed to supporting messy work will get hung up on projects that come across as messy. And the biopsychosocial projects look very messy. And there is a lot of politicking around which part of the bio, psycho, and social is actually the most important. And reviewers don't very few of them have um, the necessary expertise to really be thinking across all of those levels. Right. And so what happens very often is that those proposals get thrown out because they don't have sufficient quality indicators or criteria of excellence. So what I want to ask you, very much putting you on the spot, is if you could put out three criteria for excellence for these kinds of research proposals, <laughs> what, what would they be? Yes, that's putting me on the spot. Why three? But all right. Um, let, me, let me digress while I'm thinking hard on the question. Um, 
I, I run a psychiatric genetics research unit where I have specifically tried to recruit people who are expert in clinical diagnosis and statistics and in molecular genetics, put them in one 18,000 foot suite and try to make sure that they actively interact on almost all the research projects and train students together exactly for that reason. Because I want to be able to say, you know, I wouldn't say that each one of them is a world expert, but in aggregate we can bring people together where we really have worked together for a long time and have learned each other's language and know. And that's not straightforward or simple. And it doesn't mean you cannot have shotgun marriages. So you know, might have <laughs> the great imager who decides, oh, I'm going to collaborate with a person who does great environmental risk, and they sit down for an hour, come up with some specific game, and, and put in a grant together. I would not be prognostically positive about that. There is a common language that needs to occur before that is good. So I guess that's leading me to certainly the first criteria, which is that some of the key people involved have to have had a track record of doing work of sufficient excellence that can cross boundaries so that you're likely to know that you're going to get meaningful work rather than this sort of little symbolic stuff. So I do the imaging study with one little environmental thing kind of sprinkled on rather than something that's more deep and integrated. Um, I think the other problems are the quality of the expertise in, in various areas. And some of the work, what you get is you've got a real expert in one area. You know, he's got a big group. And he decides, oh, I'll recruit a, you know, a first-year postdoc in area B who's been there for three months, and you're here to do the big collaborative thing. And the postdoc might be fairly good, but you know that if the grant gets funded, it's going to be this guy's work, and this one is purely window dressing symbolically. So I think that's really a structural issue. That's two. I don't know if I'm going to make it to number three. Um, but I, I recognize the overall impediments. And I think there's also, to be honest, what's the right word? There's a little professional jealousy that arises sometimes. That is. We have you know, groups that have common themes. And if you come in, and I think this has been true within my own career, I work, you know, I'm a genetic epidemiologist primarily, but I've kind of gone and I've worked in the area of drug abuse. I've worked in the area of crime. And I, I work pretty hard. I don't claim I know as much about them. But sometimes you get into this, well, you're not a card carrying X, therefore I can't possibly approve you. And that I think the funders have to discourage. I, you know, that, that, that doesn't mean, you, you will have people who are poor and superficial, but there are others who really have a genuine interest, have a history of doing true integrative research, have published some papers. You have to give cut some slack because one, one group leader is never going to be sufficiently expert in those areas. Does he have the collaborative? Has he had the tradition of really bringing in these good people, developing the consultants? Because you don't want to encourage really mediocre cross-collaborative research. That really defeats I'm interested in uh, your um, view about the relationship between two of those central ideas in your talk. So one idea I, I took it was uh, we need to be open to the idea that the taxonomy of psychiatry is in pretty poor shape, um, that the ontology of, of taxonomy might be problematic and that we might be stuck in a sort of a, a local minima. The other idea was that the causal structure of psychiatric kinds might not closely resemble a, an hourglass figure. Um, but there might be sort of causal factors at, at various levels. Now, how are those two ideas related? Uh, one possibility, which you didn't endorse, but I, but I wonder whether you think it's true, is that a better taxonomy for psychiatry would be one where the kind's more neatly mapped onto an hourglass structure, so that the reason why we've got the kind of the dappled picture we do is we've got a bad taxonomy, a bad, bad on ontology. Uh, and where we'd improve on that, we would have a single level of causal analysis, so to speak. Is, is that what you think? That's a great question. I, I absolutely disagree. But it's a great articulation. So th the, way, the way that I frame that is that's roughly the mental retardation model of psychiatric illness. So we go back to 1860, and we had a clinic of mental handicap. What we would have from that is a bunch of people who had quite individually discrete causes, many of which basically caused the whole syndrome. So you could have the Down syndrome, you could have the person that had the birth complication, you could have the person with the amino acid abnormality with the small CNV. So that means that really what we have in psychiatry, let's take depression, is dozens and dozens of subforms, each of which are a result of a single cause. 
and the, the way we've mostly disproved this, we talked about this a little bit last night, is that was part of the basis of what Mendelian models would have been. So we went off. It turns out that, for example, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease have Mendelian subforms, where you actually, for there's three genes in Alzheimer's that are inherited as an autosomal dominant. They look like Alzheimer's. They'll make it ill when they're 35 or 40. And th those have single causes. You don't have, you have aluminum, nothing else. It's just a single overall cause. We couldn't find, no one has come up with Mendelizing forms of schizophrenia having searched most of the world in other areas. I am much more of the opinion that these are deeply and inherently, by their nature, multi-causal entities. And that partly because I've spent 30 years of my life trying to chip away, pulling out causes that have really, really distinct ones. Now, examples of ones that are a little bit successful are pulling bipolar illness out of major affective illness. But anyone who claims that then bipolar illness has got a simple etiology is absolutely wrong. It's probably somewhat different from the rest of them, but these are, in, in my view, inherently complex. This could be disprovable. I have publicly said I don't think there's any more treponemes, PDDs, that should be discovered. We will see, uh, because that's partly what, you, what, that, what that model would suggest, that underneath this, there are these single etiologies, which we map them, all of a sudden their disorders and their causes would snap together as we would see for these Mendelian-like disorders. That's it. Thank you very much for your lecture. I just wanted to mention that there's a third possibility. You said that, that one possibility is that mental disorders and mental symptoms are natural kind. The second possibility is that they are not. And I just wanted to suggest, could it be possible that perhaps the language we are using to describe them, to capture them in language, is not, is, is not fit for purpose? Because we are describing human behavior using the language uh, created by Aquinas, Augustine, Christian philosophy, the Greeks. Uh, and perhaps the terms, emotion, reason, will, executive functions, delusions are not fit for purpose. So I thought, I don't know whether you thought about, possi about that possibility. Uh, I have read in that area, and honestly I would say I don't have the philosophical sophistication to respond at that level. I did, as I mentioned yesterday, begin my career as a naive realist. That I thought that those things were real out there. I think I don't believe that anymore. I have partly been mostly convinced by um, the um, argument of, what's, what's the term? Well, the, um, we, we, keep, we always think that um, we currently have the best system of science, but the science always gets proved wrong. Pessimistic induction, that, th that theory. That argument hit me like a ton of bricks. So those of you that are not familiar, it's just the idea that at more or less, if you look through the history of science, every major theory, including Newton, have always been proved wrong, and yet every current generation thinks, oh, that won't apply to my theory. Those all other guys were all wrong. In psychiatry, if you th you, one can easily name 20 diagnoses that have been abandoned. And if I sit here and think, oh, DSM is right, DSM will never be replaced, that's completely untenable. So at that level, I think that's true, that kind of classic realism. I think that areas that treat psychiatric disorders in a more instrumentalist or pragmatic way are really quite appropriate and useful models. They are less ambitious. I also think that if you adopt a more coherence theory of truth, that you can make more sense. Because part of what we want, which is not claiming some external reality, is that when I, what I want from a disorder is this feeling of taking the last piece of a puzzle and snapping it in. And by doing that, I learn lots of other things about what that person is because it fits into this whole web of other kinds of categories. I don't have to claim issues so much about reality. So, so I'm, I'm not personally willing to give up on useful categories. I hear and partly appreciate the subtleties of decision of language. My, my colleague, Aaron Barrios, talks a lot about these. I don't know if you, if you know him. Um, I, I, whether it's because of my ignorance, I'm not so deeply sympathetic to the more pragmatically minded. But I would still be in the area that categories are important to us. We can do a better job. We should not be so metaphysically ambitious as to claim that these things are real in a perpetual way, but I don't think we should abandon them. Thank you for your really uh, enlightening voice, Bob. 
Um, I, I want to do a bit of a recap, if, if I may, uh, Professor Lobel and, and I have known each other for many years, and I think the reason we're here is, um, first of all, that we believe that there is a rich vein to be tapped by bringing together philosophers, research scientists, and clinicians, and that this has to impact research and education in psychiatry, if not in medicine in general, but certainly in psychiatry. I wonder if you could take perhaps our closing moments to speculate on how we can be most impactful on research and education as we clarify different elements of this model and clarify our uncertainties and the ambiguities inherent in the subject matter. Big points. Um, I was asked for the first time about a year and a half ago to talk to the directors of the residency programs in psychiatry. And I thought I was an unusual choice. They had read some of these articles here. And it was a pretty emotional experience. It was really a kind of standing room only crowd. And at the end of the talk, people stood up and cheered. I'm not used to that among these academic audiences. Um, and what they were responding to was you're working hard to give us a structure that's not trivial, that's deep, that we think we can teach to residents and provides a structure and a way of thinking about this complexity that we can feel proud about. How can we begin to work in to these kinds of concepts in psychiatric education? Now, now my response to them is I'm not the person to do that. Um, and we had a beginning discussion about the potential of trying to write a book for residents that would try to organize some of these themes. There's been some discussion in that area um, that hasn't moved a great deal. But I would say that at that point, there was I, I would have described it as a hunger on the part of trainee residents to have a system that is structured, that's not trivial, that's challenging, but not inchoate. And it's not this feeling of you know, what one one group competing against another. A, a short digression, that is my own residency training at this you know, wonderful academic institution. It became clear to me a year through my training that when I was meeting with the psychoanalyst, his job was to try to convert me to a psychoanalyst and tell me how stupid and backward all the biological psychiatrists were. When I met with the biological psychiatrists, they were trying to tell me, don't believe anything those guys say. So it wasn't someone was trying to treat me, teach me how to be a whole and grounded psychiatrists, they want to convert me to their subform. That's really maladaptive. Um, and boy, we have to do better than that overall. Now, research, that's harder only because funders determine that in other ways. Um, I think the RDOC perspective that INSEL is doing, this is an IMH, and this may be more particular for those in the US, um, it has some positive benefits in trying to combine areas, but INSEL has also slashed much of the funding for epidemiology. He is very brain-based and uh, does not have, and if you listen, for example, to Nora Volkow, when she talks about drug abuse, I think she has a much deeper appreciation. Now, drug abuse does have these very strong social components, and actually she is more supportive of these kind of integrated policies. So, for example, NIDA and IAAA are trying to develop this big longitudinal study starting over about a 15-year period that's looking at neuropsychological effects of drug and alcohol abuse using sequential MRI scans, but they're doing very rich psychosocial assessments, trying to understand what's causing the kids to drink, what kind of peers they're interacting with, how the parents are interacting. That's pretty exciting. Uh, really making investments in these more multidisciplinary perspectives. And at least in the US, when you give grants, people stand up and take notice <laughs> very quickly. A and you can sometimes bring together these collaborative teams. Sometimes they almost enforce it from other groups, bringing in good twin researchers and good psychosocial researchers trying to do that. So that's largely in the governance of how funders organize their research. A and that's going to be harder to influence, at least from my ground. But it is a great question. And I certainly, you know, I don't want to do this just in silence. If all I'm doing is writing papers for myself, you know, I can go off and do my genetics. I do this because this stuff really deeply matters to me. I care about the field. I think DSM is a very important thing we have that has to be protected. But we, we can do so much of a better job of presenting our field and its structure and its excitement than we currently do.
Well, uh, what a privilege it's been and what a tour de force of 30 years of psychiatric genetic epidemiology and what a wonderful inaugural lecture to, to kick off the reinvention or the next version or edition of the biopsychosocial model. Um, we are in England here and I've, I've been here 12 and a half years so I know that people will not in England stand up and, and cheer <laughs> at the end of this. But if they weren't in England, I'm sure they would cheer. So please join me. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful <laughs> Thank you.